should have signed up for the uh, December 11th holiday party. We still have uh, the forms out there. Take them home, fill them out, and send them to Marvin. All right, if you haven't done that, please do it. Now, we would like to get on with our program of this evening, and it's our very own Pete Owen. Now, uh, Pete's been, how long have you been a member, Pete? A year or two, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. So let's call him a fairly new member. Uh, but the work he has done on restoration of AKs, uh, was it 10C, what is this? That's a radio time, 1923. 1923. Um, it's absolutely amazing, and it, he's done his work uh, pro bono for our museum, so we can really appreciate that. Okay, so without further ado, here is Pete Olo. Should he work on this mic? Why, why don't you put the lapel mic on him? Okay. Turn that one on, put the lapel mic on him. We'll do. sizes and shapes. This is the most common kind here, the model 10s, there's five different varieties of this. But they come in smaller ones, one, two, three, five, all different kinds of different sizes. Uh, and they only made them from 1923 to 1924. This came out the very end of 1923, and wives got tired of dusting them through 1924, so that was kind of the end of them. This is the Model 12. It's got extra audio stages on it here. This is one I did not too long ago. Uh, it's got a big crack in here, but that's before, and then this is what it looks like afterward. There's no finish on it, it's all rushed. And that's just exactly the way it arrived. I'll get into what all was done to it. Uh, this is just another one I did not too long ago. But the finish is completely ruined, coils all skewed, whatever. So, and this one is the one you have here in front of you here tonight. You can see there's no paint on it whatsoever, and very little. It's there's no finish. It's it's in lousy shape. But this is what it turned out to be. So what I'm going to try to do right now to see you is to explain what we've done to these things to get them in these conditions. And I'm not, you may disagree with some of the things I do because they're not original. I do things to circumvent the originality demands. Some people I say, oh, it's you know, got to be some particular uh, type of varnish, something like that. Well, this stuff's not available. So I use what is available to get the results I want. Basics. The board's got to be stripped, first of all. Everything's got to be taken off. The uh, tube sockets, everything. Uh, normally on most of the radios, you'll remove everything from the top. And then on the bottom, all the wiring will be removed. This one is slightly different. You remove the bottom the wiring first from the bottom and take stuff off the top. Uh, you have to take good photos of the thing before you get it, before you start taking anything off. Take good photos and enhance them if you can if you've got Photoshop to trace your wires so you know where the things went before you, when you put it back together. Uh, and print good photos, that kind of thing. The wires on the other side are held in by little thin U-nails, which you can't see many of them here. But they're, they're cut off, they're very rusty and they fall apart. They're copper clad, but you can just make them with cheap 
soft steel wire from a hardware store. Uh, and whatever you take off, save. That includes the label tax, the little upholstery tax all on the paper labels underneath. You've got to save them because they're rusted and you want rusted tax. It's going to look lousy if you put new tax on the bottom of the board. It's going to stand out and look really lousy. So save your rusted parts. This is just a sample of what I do for the photos of the underside. I go ahead and I highlight. Sorry about that. Go to your back. Oh, hang over here. Now we'll go forward. I'm not used to this device. One more. Okay. Uh, as you take the wires off, label them with masking tape, get out a pen, give them a number, whatever system you want. But just make sure they're all labeled clearly because you're going to need to put the wall back on. It gets very confusing if you don't have, if you don't know where these, these wires went. Likewise, what's happening here? I'm trying to figure this button out. I'll make you a deal. I'll, I'll, I'll navigate the slides. OK, let me try once more. I'll keep my thumb off of it. Oh, okay. That's what I'm trying to do. This little tack holding down the wires. Pry them up gently with your, uh, with, with your cut wire cutters is what I use against the metal surface. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a steel rule. This way, you're not going to put any dents in the bottom of the uh, of the wood. It just it just looks nicer. And these taps often they'll rust and fall apart, so don't just sleep over it. They only are just one piece of rust anyway. Uh, I'm going to jump right ahead now to coil winding. They all have three coils. Most of you have three coils. Don't worry, I just thought about these strange things here. They're not necessarily in sequence. The gauges vary depending upon the model. No two gauges, no two models have the same gauge. They start out with around 23 gauge, I believe, up and then by the time they finish making the last one, these are up to 27 gauge. And they use weird gauges in between too. It's whatever came off the shelf that day uh, is what they put on here. The coils of the wood, these are all rewound. They rewound all these coils, and I'll show you how I do that. Uh, I buy the cord, the wire on eBay. There's always a big demand for this stuff. It's a double cotton coated wire. Once I screwed up and I thought I was buying copper wire, they didn't specify it, but it was some kind of very highly resistive wire, uh, which now I use for, for as resistors anyway. Uh, so again, these are all wired and dyed to be the right color. <laughs> There's holes, round coils, big hanging holes, and originally they're held in place with toothpicks, the round toothpicks. So you do the same thing when so you start the wiring, push your toothpick, hold the wire in place, wrap your coil, and when you get down to the end, push your toothpick in. After you round all three coils, or two coils, whatever you have in the radio, you want to measure the inductance to make sure it's the same on all of them. They all have to be the same. I use just a cheap, $50, $60 LC meter uh, to measure the inductance. I don't really care what the inductance is. One thing on these inductances, the resorts are tuned to one of the two more toward the low end of the dial, maybe 500 kC to, to 1000 uh, kC. I want to move them up a little bit further because there's nothing below, five, you know, below 550 or whatever. So I try to use a slightly heavier gauge wire, which will give me fewer turns, less inductance, it'll move me up slightly more in the frequency band. So I may be able to move and receive up to 1400 kc on these radios just by cheating by using a heavier wire. Uh, toothpicks using a heavier gauge, and I glue them slightly in place with a very dilute solution of carpenter's glue and water. I mean really dilute. They're not going to shift much, but I use that on there anyway, and I dye them by brushing on with an acid brush, um, fabric dye, wool dye, something like that, and get the original, get the color to tan. Uh, originally, these were an olive drab, very, very 
dull, white, all drab, but they very quickly turn into tan. And I've made a mistake in the past of doing them in the original color, and everyone throws a fit. Ah, what is this? It looks lousy. Who comes up with the green? So I no more green. I'll, I'll, I'll pre-age them and do them all tan. This is just how I do. No one is expecting to go out and buy a metal lathe, but I have one and I use it. So this is just how I wind coils very tightly. I have very bad arthritis in my hands, and I don't have much choice. I have to use a lathe. And I have a picture of winding coils on a lathe. How many turns goes on in the Normally between 80 to 90. Depending on what the gauge is, you want to match roughly the same gauge. You can do it by hand, like I say, it's nothing, there's nothing magic about doing this. But I do it by the lathe. This is hard to see, but this is what's inside the final output amplifier stage of the detector and the two audio stages. It's one big mass of tar. Uh, and there's two transformers in here too. Both those transformers are going to be open. So you've got to chip this tar out. <coughs> Don't, don't even try to match this wiring. Go by schematic and redo it that way. Because you're going to get the, the, a new transformer from AES or wherever. It's just a common, there's nothing significant about the transformer. Just plain audio transformer. Uh, uh, where am I? It's guaranteed so, to be open, Pete? Pardon me? It's guaranteed to be open? Guaranteed to be open. So you got to get if some people got to chip this thing out and they, they melt the tar and go, I just know, yes, yeah, I don't go through that. I'll chip it out with a hammer sometimes and I want to bury the transformer in there. But there's enough room under the cover here so you don't have to worry about chipping it out. You can just invest them underneath here. There's enough room without having to, to uh, take the tar out. Is it standard order transfer? What's the impedance? Pardon me? What's the impedance factor on the transformer? It's, I couldn't really tell you. It's just going to go for you know, like a 200 ohm plate resistance type stuff. It's, it's very extremely basic because you're only using a 018 tubes. So. Sort of. Probably like three. Yeah, three, three, three to one ratio basically. Like three to one for really, uh, you know. Just, you know a step up. But you, know, you, need enough, you, want, you want enough, you know, a couple hundred ohms DC resistance because that's going to be, you want to limit the plate current somehow. You don't want to have a <coughs> five ohms. You're going to be having no cathode. Real quickly, I'm going to, I'm going to branch off here into tuning condensers. There are three on here. They go down in value every superseding model. Capacitors are always screwed up on these. Um, so this, you have to know what you're doing with capacitors. They're not just whatever. Let me start real quickly. This is going to be a basic condens tuning condenser class for anyone who hasn't played with condensers. This is the ideal position here, perfect spacing between the stator and the rotor. Now, some people think it doesn't really matter as long as it's not touching, but it makes a tremendous difference. It's not a fact that it adds on one side and subtracts from the other. It makes a tremendous difference that got to be in the center. And I know them, actually, when I put these things all together, I know them. So I, may, I adjust the condensing rotor plate for minimum capacitance so I can guarantee that my tracking will be perfect. The other thing I do, which is very important, on a, on a, first thing I do with a, on a, with a capacitor is I look at it this way, and I rotate it through, looking at this point, as the plates mesh, rotate it through slowly and make sure I don't see any bent motor plates. That's going to guarantee that these plates are perpendicular. If they aren't, I'm going to bend them to the perpendicular. I don't really care about how they line up with the stator. I just want to see them line up on this edge. That's just going to guarantee me a perfect rotor. After that, I'll worry about aligning the stator, which is there's always places to adjust the stator. Let me show you one of Kippy on this one. Things that you don't want to do. This is your condenser. 
very exciting. You take the back plate off. They're all basically the same thing. And you can turn this, the rotor, and it'll pop right out. So you aren't all of them. The wind, people in the past, for some reason, moved plates around. They added passes on here, they added, <coughs> they give you a little screw. And one thing I did for the club, for the museum, was totally screwed up. They put like three extra plates in this one, and they, they took them out of here. So I had to wait back, put them all back in the right, the right places. Why they're camping in the middle, I don't know, but it's very common. Uh, also, the depth of the rotor. As always said, on every convention, there's always kind of a tuning screw and locking up on the end for the rotor. That's important to adjust that. Even on your, you know, up to your, up to your 1940s, you're still going to find an adjustment screw for the rotor. And I'll, I'll work it in here. One thing I don't want to do on that rotor kit is here, there are two little screws here and a uh, Oscar bronze thing here. That's the axis for the rotor in the front. So I don't want to take this piece off and polish it to make it look nice because it's not going to work. You're not going to get the thing aligned right again unless you go through a, 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 the procedure of using shims with the thing in full mesh, which I'm not going to go through tonight. But it's a messy process because unless you have the shims to do it, you have to make shims out of soda bottles. It's kind of thing. Just really a copper strip. Don't ever take it off. Clean the rust that's in there. That's where they need to be. We're just going to make the contact. But never even move it. These two screws stay. Don't touch them. So we're asking for big trouble if you do. Um, very time consuming to play with that game. Do you buff out the plates? Some of our club members. Oh, that one. There's no need there. They're, they're really funny looking. Yes. Some of them have blue oxide on them. I clean them off. Yes. Sometimes I take a little report to take the Sand and yes, I'll do that sometimes. But only when they're really ratty looking. But I always go over the edge. Just to, to, to uh, always go over this and find sandpaper. It looks nice. Have a nice bright shiny edge. Not necessary with cosmetics. It's something I do. When you're going through a little capacitor, never go to full mesh and bend the things so they look nice, they look perfect when they're in full mesh. Because you're going to screw things up. You're starting with your rotor, you're guaranteed the plates are perpendicular. If you go through and you bend your plates, when it's, when it's, when it's screwed, you turn it 90 degrees, this is what you're going to get. And the result of that, okay, this is something else. The result of all these, these skewed rotor and stators is that you all see this. Let's say there's a frequency dial, 53, 600, 800, 1,000. Let's say, when, let's say 10, 10 rings or whatever. That's going to appear like 10, 10, 50. The center of your dial is going to be all screwed up. Only because down at this end, you normally have some kind of a, uh, you can slip the dial to the low end, adjust the coil, or you've got a pattern, you take your low end accuracy. At the high end, you've got a trimmer, and that leaves the middle to be totally screwed up if you've got your capacitor is not, is not aligned right. The most common thing you're going to find is mainly just adjusting the depth of the rotor, tightening some screw and nut on one end, and make sure they're in the dead center. If you can, get your capacitance meter out and know that capacitance makes this the lowest value you can get. Uh, important, very important. Finishes and finishing. Uh, I mean, if you've got, got the radio, it might have been really stuck up on the outside. How do the plates get so, how, they just warp or? I'm not sure what it is. Uh, or they just, the material's probably not that, that stable. Uh, Bakelite, I'm not sure, it doesn't seem to have any, it seems to be dimensionally stable. But for some reason, where, I don't know. But they always get screwed up in these things. And it's, it's not unusual to see it in, in like in the Philco's or any, any tuning condenser. If you dial screw off in the middle, start, start adjusting the end light and screw on your capacitor and then set for a minimum capacitance. Uh, 
Okay, finishes and finishing. One thing that's important on these things, now you notice since this thing is not glossy, shiny, and all kinds of stuff like some people do, it's got these sick, you know, this, the, the high gloss sheen, I can't stand that stuff. One reason why, it looks like hell, but the original description for Atwater Kent on their ad is a beautiful dull rub surface. It's not high gloss, you know, like a zillion coats of lacquer, high polish, it's dull rub surface. That's kind of like what this is here. My process on these is very simple. Oh, a little here. Or in finishing, did I spell that correctly? I guess it's all right. I never sand forever whatsoever. Right now, if I had this board completely clean, I'm going to strip it. And if it has original lacquer on there, I'm going to try to retain it as much as I possibly can. I want to save that color. Like this one, the early ones are reddish. So I maintain this one with a, with a stain. But normally I use a dark walnut stain. The original ones were dark walnut stained. Uh, they don't, didn't rely on the age of the uh, lacquer aging and turning dark over time. They actually use stains, and that's called for in the, in the elegant literature. So I have a stripped down board. I don't sand because that's going to really screw it up. So sanding is absolutely out. If there's any lacquer originally on there, I keep it on there as much as I can. I'm going to scrub with acetone. That's my favorite liquid is acetone, because I can't drink anymore. Uh, this is a scotch Brite pad. I use this with acetone and scrub down the board. If there's still finish on there, I'm going to leave the finish on there, but I'm still going to scrub it down with acetone. If I use denatured alcohol, I may leave a white stain, so I try to avoid denatured alcohol. When it comes to the actual finish, wiping it down with the stain, um, I use no grain fillers. I never have, never will, on any radios. If you stop and think about it, you don't think that all these various people who made like these cabinets, or because they're going to stop and have some little man there putting grain filler and sanding it and doing all this stuff. No, it's production. So they did, they find, they found a method of using some kind of a heavy lacquer or some kind of a heavy finish, which they didn't have to use grain fillers. Consequently, I don't use grain fillers. I've had no problem <coughs> not using grain fillers. I'm not saying don't use them. I don't use them. I find them unnecessary. I use a very heavy coat of, war of lacquer. Uh, and that works into two things. Spray can lacquer tends to be brittle. It scratches easy. I try to avoid it. Nowadays, I'm using piano lacquer. It's, I'll get into that. OK, what do you mean stain? I do three repetitions of lacquer, sanding down with wet sandpaper, not dry, or you wet sandpaper. I don't cover the bottom at all. I do three repetitions, breaking up the final sanding of the 800 1,000 paper. After I finish the 1,000 or the 800, it doesn't matter, because I use a lot of dead sandpaper, the stuff that's really, really worn out. I like that stuff. I use it a lot. Uh, and then I use automatic automotive paint compounding. It comes in a, in a liter bottle, the white paste, write it down. It gives you that perfect finish. Put a bit of wax on top of that, and you get the perfect dull finish that's expected for this model, for these, these uh, breadboards. Pete, what was the original finish? Exactly what you see. Johnny, I mean, so was it lacquer? It was lacquer. Was lacquer that early? I thought they used shellacquer. No, actually, I, I, I shouldn't say it was lacquer. It was something that was close to a lacquer. It was alcohol sol soluble to a degree. Uh, Denatured alcohol does work. Acetone will dissolve it. I don't know exactly what the chemical was, but they used. It's nitrocellulose lacquer. And okay. nitrocellulose lacquer could be used for paint on a car starting in 1923. And earlier it was used on some of these products. Uh, they didn't use varnish. And shellac died around 1900. Good. Thank you. That answers that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, brass. There's a zillion pieces of brass. This one has a lot more brass on it than most of them do. And say, these are usually gold plated. So be careful with these things. These, 
putting out all the gold plating. So don't say much. Uh, I found early on, and some of you probably done it too in cleaning brass, stick all the brass and you fill it in a jug and throw some acid in there and hope it'll come out white and clean and clean. Well, it doesn't. We get everything copper. Because the acid pulls the zinc out of the brass and then you left with a whole bunch of copper fixtures. So be very careful when you use the acid. You can use it to get some of the crud off, but don't really soak them in there for more than a few minutes. Uh, acid, vinegar, and lemon juice, that's all I ever use. Uh, I always use a Dremel tool, a tremendous amount. I use the softest steel brushes I can get because I can't find brass ones anymore. So a soft steel Dremel brush is what I use to clean every one of these things. Not enough to score the metal, but just enough to clean it. And then uh, they all get lacquer sprayed. The lacquer spray I use, you must, it's aged. There's no bright, shiny brass here. It's all very, very aged looking. That's because I'm using Starcast Amber lacquer. This is how I get through Grizzly. It's bailing. It's a bit old, you know, it's like fairly common. Starcast Amber, a very light spray, and you put 80 years of age on your brass, and it's protected. Okay, so, so you're saying that brass that you have on display there was dremel brushed and, and no further polishing? No, I did. Dremel brush, that's it. Nothing further, nothing further. And then sprayed with this. And I do it bulk spraying, like this. These are all the little nuts. And all of all the tube sockets in place here, they're all stuck on toothpicks. And then just all sprayed, you know, two, two, uh, two passes of the spray can, and then they're all aged 80 years. Binding post identifiers, which they're hard to identify, but little labels here to go underneath the binding post here for antenna and for the uh, input voltages. I spray paint them flat black. I clean them up a little bit. Spray paint them flat black, not gloss. It's important. Uh, I can black paint is nice. Flat black will give you a little thin coat. Gloss, boom, and you can't sand off with it. And there's no reason why I can't use gloss. Once it's painted and nice and dry, I use completely, totally dead sandpaper, wet, put it against a glass surface, and then take these little emblems and gently rub them in a circular motion because they're all embossed. So it'll bring all the lettering up beautifully on you know, a nice black background, which it's supposed to. Once that's done, one quick shot with this, and you've got a brand new 80-year-old label. Um, very lightly, so that's so much for that. Okay, now with the paint. Don't remove the paint unless it's really lousy and rusty. On this model, it doesn't really matter because there's no texture on the paint. <clears throat> but in other words, you have the, the all subsequent models, the paint has a texture, and you don't want to destroy that texture. The reason you can save that texture, okay, if you need it, if it's really ratty, like these were all, all rusted, so it didn't really make much difference. Go through the priming uh, to stop the rust, automotive primer, and, well, okay. If it's really bad, you got to go through a wrinkle process, wrinkle paint process, which I'll cover. No, like this horn was one mass of rust. Now, it looks reasonably good, but this is a wrinkle finish, which um, is kind of a trick in itself. It's easy to screw up black wrinkle to the wrinkle paint. It's black wrinkle, and I paint over that with the, late, the diluted latex brown paint to get the exact color that I want. Black wrinkle process, if you haven't done it, the whole key is to keep the metal warm to 120 degrees and put on a heavy coat, measure the temperature with your temperature gun, make sure it stays at 120 degrees after you paint it for three minutes. Put the second coat on, and after that, put it in the kitchen oven, which is that you preheated nicely, not to something with morning temperature. I turn the oven on and let the door open, let it cool down a bit, set this in there, and then it'll, it'll do its wrinkle thing over the next 15, 20 minutes. Can we bring it over to your oven? Yes, you may. <laughs>
Uh, that's about it. And also, if you do the wrinkle stuff, let's don't be in a rush to put an overspray over it. Give it a few days to harden. If it's still a little bit soft after a couple of days. Have you had any uh, experience with wrinkled paint? Wrinkled paint? Yeah. Yes, that's what I have on here. So it is a wrinkle of paint. Wrinkle paint. I'm using Eastwood black wrinkle finish. And I prime, put this stuff on, you know, the stuff, that's exactly what this is called for. And uh, then this is oversprayed with the right color. Hey, was that a process that you developed? Or was that no, this is, I think, pretty much what you're supposed to, but after screwing things up for so many years, I finally narrowed it down to this process works beautifully. I've never had any problem with it. What, what do you prime? I find the metal once it was rusted, I prime it. The metal is rusted, I prime it. You prime with what? Oh, just plain automotive, you know, red, red lead, whatever you've got. Doesn't really matter. Latex paint. <laughs> <laughs> People feel fit when you say you've done this stuff in latex, but you know, who knows the difference? Did anyone know this was latex paint on here? No. This is latex paint on top of the wrinkle. I spray latex on with a, I have a you know, paint compressor, not everyone has one, but I do anyway. It's, you know, it's yes, here's job, whatever. And, and a $30 sprayer from Grizzly. And I dilute the paint with um, denatured alcohol, so it's nice and watery. It gives you a nice, very light coat. Enough coat so you retain all the original texture on the original paint. You don't want to screw up the texture. So and, uh, you want to keep, you can't match the old texture. You just wrinkle fine. Um, so latex could go on top of black and no problem? No problem at all. And you're diluting the latex with wood alcohol? Or yes. I know, it looks beautiful. <coughs> um, to get the color, you can always get the color warming off the bottom of this unit, it's normally in pristine shape under the underside of this assembly. You know, get the color match, you take it over to Home Depot and a computer match it. You buy a quart of semi-gloss paint and that's all that's on these things. It's, it's cheap, it's easy, it looks nicely with alcohol, it washes nicely with alcohol. Uh, it's just one of the nicest, nice things. Um, that's about it. Let me see what else. Dials and knobs down to the end of the things here. Some of these sets you see on, in, online have these gaudy white numbers. And I think that looks like hell, quite frankly. Because the usual ones were, were ivory color. It's off-white, not, not white. You use ivory to fill these things in. It's very easy just to wipe it on with your finger and a damp rag and nose are finished. And then they're filled in. And you wax the thing and everything else. Brand new, perfect, or whatever. Nothing like this. Let's see, is there anything else here? I know I'm going to do this fast, but just a rough list of transform materials you're going to need for these things. Audio transformers, you can get them from AES or the guy that makes the RDs uh, power supplies. Power cables, this one doesn't use a power cable, but all subsequent models get out of power cable, eight conductor, six conductor. I use the eight conductor, and for the wires that go to the filaments, I parallel inside the cabling so there's less IR drop in the cabling. You're not going to waste any voltage in there. You know, it's such a relatively small amount of current. The cabling is there, so I use it. Uh, black wrinkle paint, I buy that online from Eastwood. Nothing spectacular. Tone lacquer, that comes from. Well, you can buy that anyway, anyone that sells the Balan, uh, Balan products. Like I say, I generally buy it from Grizzly because I buy a lot of other machinery and stuff from Grizzly. Tubes, they're normally almost always O1As. Uh, models before this used the 01 tubes that take the one amp filaments. But these are the O1As, which is the half amp filament. So you save your battery life there. That's the difference between the O1 and the O1As is without the A, they're one amp filaments. You're, just, you're killing your, your storage battery for the filaments here, you know, pulling one amp for each tube, you're gonna kill your battery very fast. And for a power supply, just use the standard 
RB, whatever it is that everyone uses. Uh, everything else here, pretty much covered that stone, flat back paint, uh, clear lacquer, scotch brite, wet sandpaper, vinegar. Dremel tool, I love those things. I, I, lived, I can't live without them. Um, and there's one cap that goes inside these things, really on the bottom. That's an audio decoupling cap down there, a big black thing. And this end, I slipped the wires in there. That's not connected. It's in there, but it's not connected. Uh, inside the, inside the um, spaghetti there, there's an open. And I just locate that capacitor inside here to the same electrical point. So no one knows the better. And we've got a, a nice modern decoupling cap. I think that's it. How many hours are into that? 25 to 30 hours on the average. Is that on there? Yeah, sorry. Oh, yeah, that, that, that's for me. It depends, you know. Depends on that. <laughs> How many of those sets have you done? So I think I've got, right now I have five of these, I have all five of these models. Two of the 12s, I've got two of the nines, I've got a one. I got, I got about maybe 10 of these red boards at home. And then some people have asked me to restore them for them, so those have gone on. It's all, it's all gratis stuff that I do when I do those restorations, like for the clubs. I never make any profit. Actually, I actually lose on every one of them, but I get all the time in the world, I don't work. <laughs> Are there any electrical lines to go through? No, because there's nothing to the line. The only thing is the variable are these capacitors. Mm -hmm. And the only thing you have to do is make sure you adjust the for minimum uh, capacitance with the depth and depth adjustment for the rotor and the stator. But there's no, there's no IF, it's just raw amplifying $2 RF, $2 RF detector and two audio stages. Do you use water when you do the wet sanding or do you use oil? Where? When you say wet sanding. Oh, water. Water? Yes. Does it raise the grain on the wood at all? Not butter at all. All right. Because the wood is now is lack of oil. Okay. Um, does everybody know where Eastwood is or what Eastwood is? No. All right. All right. Yes. Yeah, it's an automobile supply house. It's an automobile, yeah. They sell stuff for cars and they sell a lot of paint products. And uh, if you go online, you're going to find all this car stuff in there. But that's, they sell all this paint supplies. There. Yes. I think Eastwood's main office or building is out in Pennsylvania. Yeah, pretty much town. They carry an entire line of different paints and stuff. Polishing materials. Yeah. Polishing materials for what? So I'm saying Eastwood. They have all the Oh yeah, that's, I just got the, the, the polishing compound just the local automobile store. It's, yeah, it's just used for rubbing out um, paint finishes on cars. Rubbing compound? Rubbing polishing, compound. And polishing compound. Polishing is, is lighter. No, this is just fairly coarse. Yeah, rubbing so is very coarse. Fairly coarse, and then I use, then once the wax is on there, you get the right, right, right texture. One of the things I've learned is to get the tar out of the pots and whatever you're doing, is to put the tar in the uh, freezer. Yeah. Uh, yes. And then, then it, it chips much better. The shower like glass. Yes. Mm -hmm. Keith, what's your experience uh, about drivers on horns? Do you work on horns too? I, I've never seen a good driver for an outwater camp horn. <laughs> <laughs> this one, I believe, is um, a, a dictaphone, I believe. And I do a fair amount of metal machine. Uh, I did a professional for years too. So the machine all these various adapters, then this they I fit them all in here. So, so you've given up on them. Oh, absolutely. But when I see a, on, online on, it, on eBay someone is selling a, uh, a, a transducer to say it's good, well, I'll buy it. So I'll make it fit somehow. So that's how I get along. So I get along with these things. <laughs> Any more? Yes, sir. You mentioned thinning the latex paint with 25% uh, grain alcohol. I assume initially you must have tried water, and why doesn't that No, I, water and, and it never worked right. I never had any luck mixing water and latex paint. It comes out to me, but it's crappy. It's called water-based paint, so one would think. Yeah, but it, it doesn't, it may work. I never, uh, I never liked it, so I found, I just use alcohol. 
I can always drink it too. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it will dry faster if I use the alcohol too. Yes? For what it's worth, I found with the latex paint, if you try to thin it with water, if you get any decent results, you tend to have problems with rust spotting if it's a light color. That's true. Mm -hmm. And you start seeing rust spots appear in the you know, weeks after the paint is dry. Good. Latex paint breathes, so the moisture can get in there. What, if if well, what's it in the first place? What's that? What, what's the vehicle for this? What's, what's the word? Liquid in the first place? Oh, well, it's acrylic uh, and latex, usually. Yeah, but it's uh, water or something. No, water's for hitting the brushes. Uh, <laughs> but what I'm saying, though, is it, it breathes, and therefore the item will rust on the new <clears throat> if it's made of ferrous metal. Mm -hmm. And if you use a latex, if you use an oil-based paint, then the air can't get through there, and it can't rust. So rust oil, what, what was rust oil originally uh, made out of, they used to claim? Yeah, oil. Fish oil. Fish oil. Fish oil. But they want a oil base to make it work. You, you can't well, well, yeah, yeah. rust without having some okay. kind of oil base. Right. And his primer is automotive, and, and <clears throat> all automotive primers that I've ever seen are somehow oil based. Yeah, they're oil based. Yeah. Primary, anytime there's rust, it's uh, yeah. fine. Even inside of these, I, 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 I wipe them out with oil or something like this to prevent the rush for us from continuing. I don't want to, I, there's still metal contacts that rub the you know, can here, and I don't want to have paint in there to destroy that contact in mean, some of these. So that's why I don't paint the insides. How about the labels on the Do you Xerox them? Or? Oh! <laughs> I, well, I do. I copy them, I photocopy them. Now this one, this is the original. I don't have any funny ones on here. But normally I have also the, 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 the original ones, which I print. I don't know if I mentioned this on, on some heavy paper that I got from the local insane asylum. Where I, if I'm on, on, a, on my, basically an employee of the insane asylum on call. But I grabbed the old, the old building. I went into there's a storage bin in the old basement anyway, and I came up with these these very hundred year old uh, file folder dividers, rusty, filthy, moldy, it's perfect for this use. <laughs> so I can burn on them with my laser printer, nice new labels that look absolutely perfectly original and use that with my rusted tacks. It's another pre-rusted tacks too, to be used. Wet paper towels and you can rust them nicely. And then then put them back on. And you have uh, something to put more line if it's in place so the rust will flow out a little bit on the label. It's all part of making antiques. <laughs> you make furniture too? Yeah, yeah. I've been for years. I made antiques furniture for years. That's it, gentlemen. You're not, you don't have this copyrighted, do you? No. <laughs> uh, would you mind if our webmaster were to put this on our website? No, right here. Would you, That's oh. good because it already is. <laughs> So great, so we'll have it up on our website, that, that information, we can always use it. And uh, we really appreciate you coming by and, and, and demonstrating this to us. It's uh, great, you know, it's something that only a few of us really uh, venture to do, so we really do uh, like it, too. And we like your candid uh, attitude, too, especially about the, uh, the horns, too. Because <laughs> I've never met one that worked, neither. <laughs> okay, all right, now look, we're gonna have the auction, okay? 
the auction here was to be a mini auction, but it seemed to be growing, so it's gotten a little larger than we expected. That's okay. Uh, we have a compilation of two, three uh, donations. Uh, we've got the uh, Limmer, uh, Mr. John Limmer. He has donated a few items more. We've had previous uh, donations from him. He's a very nice guy. Uh, he happened to be moving. He's going upstate New York, and he's been very generous, a uh, very nice man. He's from uh, New Vernon, uh, New Jersey. Uh, the other is a Fithian, Fithian, if I'm saying it correctly, Fithian collection. And that came from South Jersey, and that was uh, brought to us by our very own John Ducola, who I asked to go down and pick it up uh, a couple of months ago, which he did. So the majority of the stuff is from the Fithian collection. And then we have a late donation from our very own John uh, Dominski, and he donated a uh, tooth checker. So uh, we have that here. Now I hope everybody's seen everything because we're going to move along quickly with the auction, okay? Uh, well, this is going to be a little tough. Um, we're just going to take a pad and write the stuff down. And pay at the end. And pay at the end. Pay Sal at the end. Please uh, you know, be patient. Don't try to run out. We'll move along. But uh, don't just shove money in Sal's face and run out, okay? All right, we're going to start with our console and work our way down, okay? Yes, uh, yeah, if you click that, you click.